What's up, guys? If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Also, please smash that like button on the video and enjoy the show. Yeah, one, one of the things I think about um, that I've been thinking about recently <clears throat> is I've been studying more about sacred geometry. Have you ever had a conversation about that on here? I don't know that we've done that on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I'm not an expert on, on sacred geometry by any means, but I've been looking into it in the Maya world. And what's really interesting is if you go talk to <clears throat> modern-day Maya people, they will tell you that the flowers are in your the flowers are in our houses. That's like a common mm. saying. And so, what do they mean by the flowers? Well, you go look at Maya temples and the lentils that are up on uh, that are up on like the the temples at Yashilan. Um, <clears throat> they are they are like flower motifs that are inside of these uh, temple murals up on the outside walls of like the governor's palace. And what we end up finding out as, you know, uh, the study of the world progresses is that flowers grow to the golden ratio. They, they are, they're a perfect, mm. uh, many, many flowers are a perfect spiral and the flowers grow to a perfect ratio. That's like, uh, one to 1. 1.68. That's the, that's the golden ratio. And it is the ratio that all of our known universe obeys. So a snail, the spiral on a snail's shell is one to 1.68 mm-hmm. of the circumference of a flower and the way the petals grow is one to 1.68. The spiral of the Milky Way galaxy is one to 1.68. The Maya, somebody was sitting there looking at a flower and noticed that it was perfectly symmetrical on all sides and had that realization at some point, you know, I, I think about that, like somebody in the jungle realized that flowers and, and the shape of them were significant and that they were all the same and probably had other realizations and, and wrote it down. Oh my God, dude. They wrote down so much. Okay, I'm just gonna say this. The Aztecs, we we have so much more writing of the Aztecs. I think we have like 30 some, 37, 36 uh, sur- surviving codices that are from the Aztecs. We know that when the Spanish arrived, uh, 1519, that the Aztecs were ordering um, 485,000 pieces of paper a year. When I say ordering, we just have like kind of like the Diary of Marer in Egypt where he, where Khufu was ordering these blocks to be sent to the horizon of Khufu. This is exactly the same thing. There were guilds of people making paper in the Aztec world. They were producing 485,000 pieces of paper a year that they were writing their history with. Okay. <clears throat> that was about 1400, 1450 AD, okay? The, the, the Aztecs were barely around. They came into Mesoamerica way late in the game. Writing had already been around in the Maya world for 2,000 years. Mm. And the Maya had been making more paper every year than the Aztecs were. We know that from, uh, we know that from Spanish chroniclers that, that saw how much writing that the Maya had. The Maya had been writing for... I'm sorry. Well, they've been writing for 2,000 years, but writing on paper for over at least 1,000 years. And so Diego de Landa in like 1530-something or 1560-something uh, gathers all of the known writing that had been um, compiled over the last 100 years from the Aztec world all the way over to the Maya world. He takes it to Merida, Mexico, throws it in mounds from floor to ceiling, multiple mounds. Imagine how many books, how many pieces of paper we could put in mounds burns all of its ash. The whole history of Central what? and South America burned all of its ash. So this writing of sacred geometry was 100% written in books that Diego de Landa burned up. There are only four that survive. One of the four is called the Dresden Codex. And um, it is called the Dresden Codex because it was being housed. They don't, they don't know how it got from the Yucatan to Germany. So Dresden, Germany. I think it's Germany. This... Um, the Dresden Codex, what's interesting about it is it was being held in a historical museum in Germany in the 1940s, and the Americans are bombing the hell out of Dresden, Germany. Yeah, yeah. And um, <clears throat> and there's a really interesting story there, how we talk about like weird things happening. While the Americans are bombing Dresden, Germany, there's a six-year-old boy. He's It may not be exactly six-year-old, but a young kid, and he goes... And he goes with his parents and he hides in the Dresden Museum and he's taking shelter in there. And that city, and the whole city gets blown to bits. The, the Dresden uh, Museum of Natural History gets blown to bits. The only thing that survived in that museum was that kid and his family in the Maya Dresden Codex. That kid grew up to be an, to be an archaeologist who would 
go down to the Yucatan and specialize in the study of the Maya, and he came back and he deciphered the Dresden Codex. Son that of same a kid, bitch. isn't that crazy? What's his name? Oh God, I don't know. Right, I don't know we'll his name, <clears throat> but I know it's a true story. That's nuts. Um, <clears throat> so, anyway, so that Dresden Codex was the study of Maya astronomy. It was the study of their stars. Dude, you can write books this thick in English. That's like fine print, eleven, you know, size eleven print, just plethora of pages um, of a codex that's that's this big. And a codex is like a book, but a codex, you know, how sticky notes you can pull them up and they're like attached yep. on each end. That's a codex. That's not a book. So there's a difference between a book and a codex. So the Maya wrote codex, wrote on wrote codexes or whatever. Only four of them survived. So. You know, one of them is the Popol Vuh, which is the Maya origin story, which was copied down for over a thousand years. You have the Dresden Codex, and then you have one in Russia, and then I think there's one that's still in Mexico. But three of them are Maya legends. One is actually Maya science. But there were there were thousands, thousands and thousands and thousands of these books. And so very likely one of them detailed Maya um, sacred geometry. The Popol Vuh just touches on it for a second. Basically, what it says is that the way that the universe was created was through sacred geometry. It was like the cord was extended up to the sky. It was uh, tied in half and laid back down. And it's talking about um, we could we could pull it up and read it, but um, it's it's describing sacred geometry and it's describing how you could create the golden ratio or the the golden rectangle. And so, <clears throat> what this uh, engineer named Christopher Christopher Powell did in the 1990s, I believe was he went down into Mexico, he started studying the temples, and he realized that the temples in ancient Mexico that were created by the Maya were created using, they were they were like the exact same shape of flowers, but like maximized um, to the size of a house or a temple and then doubled. And then, and then he found out that Maya people were measuring out the stakes of their homes using a rope and cord and having it in the exact or halving the cord and laying it down in the same way that the Popol Vuh describes it. It's it's a very in-depth thing. But then he realized, oh, every single Maya temple is made to their own understanding of the one of the one to one point six eight golden mean ratio. He figured this out just in the nineties. This was this was figured out. And then we start then he starts realizing that when pe- when local indigenous people are telling him that the uh, that their houses are that the flowers are in their houses and that they're making the house they're making their houses still in the same way that the Popol Vuh says that the universe was created. These Maya people, these modern day Maya people doing this don't even realize what they're doing. But they're continuing a, a, a legacy that the ancient Maya very well knew existed. So then you go to all these temples in the ancient Maya world and you start seeing the flower murals all along it. Mm. And they were well aware of what they were doing. They were creating temples that were so perfect that they would have like something called the Temple of the Sun and the Temple of the Moon. The Temple of the Sun at Palenque faced um, faced east, and wherever the sun would rise, it would cast a shadow into the temple. And wherever that shadow landed, like the pillars that it was landing on, determined what time of year it was. And these are all aligned. And on top of that, all the temples are aligned to to Venus. So it's just like. There's this whole world there that is completely gone to us. Like we have, we've kind of figured out the secrets of some of their sacred geometry, but all of their other sciences, is, as far as how they made their concrete, it's you know, all burned. You know, you know these suspension bridges that are out here, like the um, the George Washington Bridge, and uh, yeah, even like the the Golden Gate Bridge is California, right? Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> the very first suspension bridge where we got that idea comes from the Maya. They built the very the world's very really? first suspension bridge on the Usama Sinta River. Yeah, um, that was documented by other Maya cities, and you can still see the remnants of it today. I was there in January and saw it. Yeah, they built the world's first suspension bridge, and it could handle an army of people walking across it. How, wow. The secrets of their architecture, we don't know. The secrets of their concrete, we don't we know. we burned it away. Burned all of it to ash. How many times do we have to learn in <clears> history, <throat> don't fucking burn books? Thank you for watching the video, guys. Please hit that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.